Our next fantastic speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is the current president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. Give it up for Tao Safani. Hello. Shalom. Exactly. You already know. Wow. So first I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to talk today. It's not trivial to have someone from the Ayn Rand Institute come to a CPAC conference, right? Um, so how many here have read Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, anything? Okay, so about 30, 35%. Well, if you read uh, Atlas Shrugged or one of Ayn Rand's books, you would know that Ayn Rand is not a conservative, but she is a staunch defender of liberty and the American founding principle, and she's offering new arguments of why we should fight for liberty and what is liberty. Okay, so, um, and by the way, I, if you uh, identify the hint of uh, accent here, it's Israeli. I grew up in a kibbutz. Anyone here knows what an Israeli kibbutz is? <laughs> For a kid, it's a, it's a wonderful way of living, but then communism hits you in the face. My story was then when I was 13 years old, I got a tape recorder from my family in the, in the city. So I brought it to my room, and then a day later, my, uh, my teacher shows up and says, I have to take it away. And I said, why? He said, because it's not equal to the other kids. And I said, over my dead body, you're touching this tape recorder. It's mine. And so he came back a week later and said, you know, we had a committee, and we decided you can keep it if you let all the other kids play their cassettes on your tape. And I said, fine. Nobody touched it. Right? And a day later, I went to my mom and said, either we are leaving this place, because this is a place for ants, not for humans. And we left. So um, if anyone has uh, motivation to fight collectivism, uh, you see it right here. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is not to, thank you, not to uh, convince you of anything about Ayn Rand. I'm here to offer a perspective that can offer new ammunition on how to fight the left, explaining why, and I hear a lot of whys. Why, how did we get here? So here's my story. Um, imagine you live on an island. Wow, it has even sound effects. Let's call it Australia, okay? And you love the island. It's great, the tradition, you know, the, the wildlife, the beaches, the people. It's amazing. You love the island. But then uh, things start happening. Um, let's see if it actually works. You start hearing all kinds of things. Um, storms are starting to come in, and winds of change are starting to lash the island from the right and the left. And you hear those, uh, you know, terms, new terms that you've never heard before surfacing up. And people are turning against each other and it's polarizing uh, society. And it's like, where is that coming from? And it's actually taking effect. Those ideas are not just ideas. Now they're affecting your life. And in a real way. I mean, we're starting to cancel people. It gets into politics. It's very confusing. People take it to the streets. Sorry about the American analogies here. I'm sure you can find your own Australian um, uh, examples. So people take it to the streets, and there's reactions to that from the right and from the left. And you are you know, left wondering what is going on. You are frustrated, and you have an urge to fight. But you don't know exactly what you're fighting, and where is this all coming from? So here you are, you know, in the afternoon, wondering and pondering what's going on. Where is this all coming from? And while you, you are thinking about, you know, uh, contemplating, your way of life is just fading away. We are all for liberty. Everybody's for liberty. The left is for liberty, the right is for liberty. That's what they say. We're all for freedom, but the way of life uh, that created the free countries of United States of America and Australia is losing. 
I don't share the view that we're on the rise and everything's going to be great. No, we're in the age of anti-reason. We were in the age of reason, in the Enlightenment that uh, was brought to us by amazing thinkers. And um, thanks to uh, thinkers like Immanuel Kant, who created a new subjectivist view of the world, the, uh, then you got Hegel and Marx, and then you got the bloodiest century in human history, and now we're seeing the other effects of what, it, what subjectivism is. Kant said this very clearly, critique of pure reason. Let's cut reason at its feet and end the age of reason. And what we're seeing right now is the age of anti-reason or the age of subjectivism. You ask yourself, how can a man be a woman? You know, just ask Kant. Reality doesn't exist. It's in your mind. It's whatever you want to be true is true. But I think what's going on is we are outplayed and out-strategized. And I'm going to offer a new perspective on how to think about this war of ideas. And it doesn't matter if it's how your government reacts to COVID or, um, you know, the referendum. By the way, I found it really interesting that it's a statement from the heart because a mind, a reasoning mind, would never come up with those things, right? <laughs> So just the institutionalization of uh, discrimination and race, uh, racism. But in order to understand what's really going on, I invite you to go a little deeper with me into the realm of philosophy, where it, I call it the physics of idea. What we're doing here, we're playing on the engineering level, politics, we're trying to change things. But in order to understand what's really going on, let's dive together into the depths of philosophy. So this philosopher, Ayn Rand, is offering us a, a new perspective. And in a, a famous article from Philosophy Who Needs It, uh, it's called What Can One Do? She's offering, offering us the following. She says, if you, want, if you are seriously interested in fighting for a better world, begin by identifying the nature of the problem. The battle is primarily intellectual, philosophical, not political. Politics is the last consequence, the practical implementation of the fundamental ideas that dominate a given culture, a nation's culture. So let's back, go back to the island. What you see here, what we all see is politics, what's happening in reality. But what's really going on is this. It's a tip of a, an iceberg. And what's going on is that on the top you got politics, what's happening. But below that, you get three levels of deeper and deeper realms. One is ethics, asking what is the good? Do you think the left is not thinking they're doing good? They're amazing. They're the good doers, right? So you need to ask yourself, what is driving those people? What is the good for them? What is their moral compass that they want to see? What is their vision for the future? If you understand that, you understand your enemy. And then epistemologically, what is true? Can we agree that reality is the ultimate arbitrator of truth? They don't agree. And if you don't agree on that, well, a man can be a woman, right? Gender fluid fluidity is a valid concept. And below that, of, co of course, is metaphysic. Is it all real? Now, ask Kant. No, it's not real. It's a construct of your mind. Who knows? I think, therefore, I exist. You know, Descartes. It's... It's really uh, attacking reason at its core. So if you ask the Austrian economics, they will say, but it works, liberty works. But nobody cares because most people want to be good. They want to be good, not just prosper. So here's my, um, my view of what's going on. The left is winning because it has done the intellectual heavy lifting in the last 150 years of convincing the world that they're the good doers. They're the good doers, we're the greedy capitalists. They're for the common good, we're selfish. They're for the environment, we're for profit. They are right. They are right. If you think that your moral code of what, what I know and call otherism is the moral code, then they are right. What Rand is offering us is to understand the fallacy here. The fallacy is that we need to embrace individualism. The land of the free means my life. You don't get to tell me how to live my life. It's my life. And here's the uh, fallacy. 
It says nothing about caring for other people. It says nothing about compassion. It says nothing about philanthropy. My institution, the Ayn Rand Institute, is only donations. She doesn't mean when she says be uh, selfish, she's fighting for a new concept. So let's start with, eth with uh, ethics and then go uh, to, so actually, sorry, let me just make a point about ethics. She is saying that you have to be rationally self-interested, interested, okay? And I'll explain how the left is actually destroying those concepts and fighting at the level that is way more strategic than politics. So how can they say something like this? Here's how they do it. What are we seeing here? Bottles, right? You all see the bottles here? Same colors? No. Same shape? No. What is a bottle? If you really do the investigation of what a bottle is, you'll find out that we as humans have this unique ability that makes us human to form concepts according to the uh, essential characteristic of a unit. Okay, that's what makes a bottle a bottle. This is how concepts are formed, and she is saying concepts are objective. They need to be grounded in reality. And the reason why she's calling her books on ethics the virtue of selfishness is that she wants to tell you where the valid concept of selfishness is properly understood. She identified this thing called the package deal. This is what the left is doing. This is how they manipulate the world. What they do is to take a word like selfishness and give it a new meaning. How do they do that? They give two different conceptual common denominators, which is what she called it, into one package. When you say the word selfish, what you mean is two things. Did you guys brush your teeth this morning? Very selfish. You're caring for yourself. This is a great concept. Do we have a word in the English language for caring for oneself? Pride, Pride is a, an effect. You see, we can't even think about a word that says, I am for my own being. Because what they've done is they attached another meaning to the same concept called not caring for others. And if you don't care for others, that means that every time that I care for myself, I need to feel guilty because I'm irrationally not take, caring for others. She said, that's not the way it is. You have now corrupted a concept. So she's asking us to go back and fight for the word because we are organisms that are thinking conceptually. Words are our tools of survival. So here's how you should think about it. Selfish is actually taking care of yourself rationally, which means dealing honestly and justly with yourself and with others. That's the true selfish person. And if we embrace that, then we win. Because then we are the good doers because we are for you know, prosperity and human flourishing. Now, they do the same with environment. I won't go into that. Like, what is environment? Are you talking about wilderness for baboons or for humans? Because if you're for humans, we need bigger cities. We need more concrete. We need more housing. We need more energy, right? But the, we, we let them confuse us. Because when you think environment, you think trees. Yeah, but what about me? I cannot live in the tree. Right? So you need to fight and really understand that. And she has another thing called floating abstraction. This is how you end up with words like diversity, equality, inclusion. What do they mean? How do you reduce that to reality? How do you explain that to a four-year-old? Right? So she says, a political battle is, a mere, is merely a skirmish fought with muskets. A philosophical battle is the nuclear war. And if we really need to understand why the left is winning, it's out-strategizing us. It's using philosophy. There are, if you think, if you want to research where critical race theory comes from, it comes from the 40s and 50s, started as critical theory, and then hundreds and thousands of white papers in philosophy departments turning into educational departments or education departments that teach your teachers and teach your professors that critical race theory is a thing. And then, lo and behold, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, suddenly it attacks you and you don't know where it's coming from. 
So we need to go deeper into philosophy and really get clear on what we're fighting for. If we fight for reason, if we write, fight for rational self-interest, there's no other term. You know, I wish I could say selfishness, but then what do you mean when you say it? Properly understood, rational self-interest, liberty, individual rights, the rest will follow. America and the, the, the Industrial Revolution happened because it had to happen. If you under, understand how the human mind works and why in order to conceptualize and innovate and you know, implement a vision, it needs freedom, it's like physics. I drop this thing, it will fall down. You give people freedom, they will thrive. You introduce the for a force or a risk or a threat of a force, their mind shuts down. Why do the scientists uh, in America are so much more productive than scientists in, in Russia? Are there another breed of human beings? No, they just live in a freer environment and, uh, that allows it to, to produce more. So, one last quote. She says, in an intellectual battle, you do not need to convert everyone. History is made by minorities. Or more precisely, history is made by intellectual movements which are created by minorities. Who belongs in these minorities? Anyone who's able and willing actively to concern himself with intellectual issues. Here it is not quantity, but quality that counts. And quality and consistency of ideas uh, that one is advocating. So the takeaway I want to, uh, to take is not, you know, believe in what Rand says. I do think you should read more Rand to re better understand the morality of liberty that she's offering and the epistemology that she, she's offering. And if you only read the fiction, that's the beauty of Ayn Rand. She, read, she, she wrote both fiction and nonfiction. So whatever you like, read either Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, or you can read this uh, short essay uh, collection called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Actually, I'm here on a tour trying to give that book away for free for Australian students. So if anyone wants to support us, please let us know. And what we're offering, uh, by the way, is we opened a university called the Ayn Rand University for the New Intellectual. And what we're teaching is how to think in a way that is more of the a nuclear bomb rather than a skirmish. If anyone heard about Alex Epstein, who put out uh, the moral case for fossil fuels, anyone heard about him? He's in the Senate and Congress on a weekly basis. He's, a, he's our graduate, right? So um, let's think more philosophically, go deeper than just politics. Politics, of course, is where you fight. And I'm all for fighting. But we need to get smarter and to, uh, you know, fight the, the enemy where it is. Thank you very much.